will be giving uh, a talk on uh, the Canon trial uh, for this year's uh, AI webinar. Uh, it was supposed to be only about the IDH wild type patient, but I tried to give a bit of a uh, broader overview of the entire trial. So first off, I don't have any disclosures. Then I would like to start with some background. Um, alkylating agents have been uh, studied within clinical trials for high-grade gliomas for the last three decades. This will probably still be ongoing uh, for the coming years. And one of the first uh, large trials that gave results was the ERTC 26918, which is I think, locally known as the STOOP trial, which showed that there was efficacy of temozolomide next to radiotherapy for glioblastoma patients. Afterwards, two other trials, the ERTC 26951 and the ARTRG uh, 9402, showed that there was also efficacy of PCV given either adjuvant or neoadjuvant with, uh, for anaplastic glioma patients. And in the latter two trials, um, it was shown that 1P90Q status was an important prognostic marker for patient outcome. And of course, now we know that patients that have co-deletion of 1P90Q uh, have actually an oligodendral glioma, and the ones that do not have this co-deletion have an astrocytoma. So to uh, look into the effects of alkylating agents within these two different tumor types, two new trials were started for the oligodendral gliomas, that's the CODEL trial, and for the astrocytoma, that's the CATNON trial, which I will be talking about today. So CATNON stands for concurrent and adjuvant temozolomide in 1P90Q non-codeleted anaplastic glioma. And in our trial, we included 751 patients with anaplastic astrocytomas worldwide. And we randomized them into four different treatment groups. Uh, treatment group one only received radiotherapy after surgery and no adjuvant treatments. Uh, treatment group two received radiotherapy and afterwards 12 cycles of adjuvant temozolomides. Treatment group three received radiotherapy and at the same time concurrent temozolomide, but afterwards no adjuvant treatment. And treatment group four finally received radiotherapy with concurrent temozolomide and afterwards 12 adjuvant cycles of temozolomide. This enabled us to answer the two major questions of our study. Question number one, is there any efficacy of concurrent temozolomide for anaplastic astrocytoma patients? And question number two, is there any efficacy for adjuvant of adjuvant temozolomide uh, in anaplastic astrocytoma patients? And we can continue with these primary endpoints because we have shown that in our entire cohort on the left, we can answer question number one um, because we see there is futility of the concurrent temozolomide, so there's no uh, effect for these patients. And on the right, we can answer question number two. Uh, for adjuvant temozolomide, we see there is efficacy. So in the entire cohort, adjuvant temozolomide seems to be effective, and concurrent temozolomide does not seem to be effective. However, uh, though the trial design was quite advanced in 2017, because we already focused on 1P90Q status, uh, whereas the WHO uh, was still purely, purely based on histology, at that time, the role of IDH mutations in glioma was uh, still unknown. And of course, now we know that patients with IDH mutant tumors have overall a much better uh, patient outcome than the ones with IDH wild type tumors. So in 2011, the study protocol was amended to allow for some IDH subgroup analyses. And now we can perform some reevaluation of the primary endpoints. So beginning with uh, question number one again, the concurrent temozolomide, uh, I showed before that there was futility of this within the entire cohort. This still holds true for the IDH wild type patients. However, in the IDH mutant patients, it's probably a bit more intricate. Uh, we see that up till four years to see, uh, in the survival groups, there is no effect. However, afterwards, they seem to split. Um, this by no means is significant at all at this time point, but we know from previous trials that sometimes uh, long-term survivors can have an additional effect of uh, alkylating agents. So we think it is too early at this time point to say if there is really no effect of the concurrent temozolomide 
for the IDH mutant group, we think we need uh, a bit more follow-up to give any conclusions. And then question number two uh, about the edge of entimazolamide. I already told that there was efficacy within the entire cohort. However, um, we now show that this is restricted to the IDH mutant group and that there is no effect um, of the edge of entimazolamide within our cohort of IDH wild type glioma patients, which surprised us. This brings me to my first set of conclusions for the primary endpoints. We show that there's clear efficacy of edgefentimazolamide in patients with IDH mutant gliomas. More follow-up is needed to determine effect of concurrent temozolamide in this cohort of IDH mutant glioma patients. And we show the utility of both edgefent and concurrent temozolamide in patients with IDH wild glioma. So I tried to keep this webinar a bit more interactive by adding some polls to get your opinion. The first poll is, will you treat an IDH mutant anaplastic astrocytoma patient with concurrent imazolamides. And these are the options. So please vote whether uh, in this setting you would, unless there's further follow-up that proves futility, or whether in IDH mutant astrocytoma you would not, unless further follow-up proves its efficacy, or finally, whether you want to see further molecular subgroup analysis showing which benefit, which patients benefit. I will now launch the poll. So what we see here is actually that the group is fairly divided, although the vast majority seems to think that there might be benefit that will show up with time. There's enough people that are either doubting that or want to see molecular subgroups. Let's see what our speaker would like to say. Well, all three uh, answers are, in fact, correct answers. It just depends on uh, your own opinion. I'm not here to impose my opinion. Um, so you could go for uh, the first option, uh, because as I said, uh, we know from previous trials that there can be some long-term effects. Uh, the second option is also a, a good option because, as I showed, there was it's not statistically significant at all at this time point. And of course, more temozolomide can also uh, arm your patients. And the last one is, of course, very important. We need to uh, add more molecular data to find uh, specific patients that do have benefit of this treatment. Sadly, of course, our uh, uh, our study was not powered to answer these questions, but we do prefer, we have performed some exploratory analysis, which I will be going into. So we can perform we performed epigenetic and genetic subtyping of the anaplastic astrocytoma patients because, as I said, uh, even though we can make the split between the IDH mutant and IDH wild type anaplastic astrocytoma patients, there are uh, prognostic groups within these uh, subtypes. So for the IDH mutant anaplastic astrocytoma patients, we wanted to identify prognostic epigenetic and genetic subgroups uh, based on subgroups from literature. And we wanted to add them to together to create a new prognostic predictive model for IDH mutant anaplastic astrocytoma patients. For the IDH wild type anaplastic astrocytoma patients, I think the most important thing that we wanted to do is to identify the molecular glioblastomas and see if there's any efficacy of the temozolomide within these glioblastomas. Um, of course, because we know from the uh, Stoop trial that there should be some efficacy of the temozolomide in the glioblastomas. And moreover, we wanted to know if the efficacy of the temozolomide might be related to MGMT status. So I'm going into the IDH wild type patients first. Um, as I said, we performed molecular analysis. We had uh, DNA sequencing data of about 85% of the patients, uh, which we did by a glioma-tailored next-generation sequencing panel, and about 70% had an IDH mutation. And we had DNA methylation profiling data uh, from the EPIC array, which for this uh, part of the study was uh, primarily used for the MGMT promoter status, and which we obtained with the MGMT algorithm. We also needed some of the copy number data to identify the true the molecular glioblastomas. 
So first off, for the molecular subtyping of the IDH water gliomas, uh, we identified 14 uh, H3F3A mutated tumors. Uh, we would now call these a separate nosological entity, and we're primarily interested in the glioblastomas. So that's why we excluded these tumors for further analysis. Then we identified the molecular glioblastomas uh, by the molecular features, which is either an amplification of EGFR or a mutation of the uh, TER promoter or a combined gain of chromosome 7 and loss of chromosome 10 or any combination of these three. And the tumors that had none of these molecular features of glioblastoma, we dubbed uh, grade 3 astrocytomas IDH wild type, which of course is still uh, a mixed bag of tumors. Then uh, looking to the overall survival of these tumor types, we can see that the molecular glioblastomas have, a, uh, have the same uh, overall survival as historical cohorts of histological glioblastomas as we expected. And moreover, we also see that the patients with grade three astrocytomas indeed have a better overall survival. And additionally, um, we also looked into patients that only had a uh, ter promoter mutation because there has been a lot of debate if we should call these uh, tumors glioblastomas as well. Uh, at least for our cohort, they have the same uh, median overall survival, and we think they should be called glioblastomas. So now we've selected these uh, IDH12 glioblastomas. Of course, we're interested in the effect of the timazolamide. And sadly, we see that uh, there was no effect of this tibosolomide within our glioblastomas. So on the left, you can see univariable analysis. On the right, you can see the Cox adjusted model, adjusted for age uh, and mini mental state examination and diagnosis, and the type of surgery, the use of corticosteroids steroids and diagnosis, and the methylation of the MGMT promoter. And in both figures, we compare patients that only receive radiotherapy with patients that re receive radiotherapy with any type of timosolomide. And in both cases, we do not see any effect of the timosolomide. But as I said, we also have uh, data on the MGMT and uh, methylation state. And from previous trials, uh, it seems that uh, TMZ uh, effectiveness is related to MGMT methylation. So we wanted to dig into that a little bit deeper. So when we just look into the MGMT promoter states and glioblastoma, we can appreciate that it's a prognostic, um, meaning that the patients with an MGMT methylated uh, tumor have a better outcome, which was expected. However, the real question, of course, is, is this related to TMZ treatment? And sadly, we don't see any effect of the timosolomide regardless of this MGMT status. So on the left, you see the MGMT methylated tumors, and on the right, you see the MGMT unmethylated glioblastomas. And again, we compared patients that only receive radiotherapy with patients that receive radiotherapy with any type of uh, timosolomide. And in uh, neither case, uh, the timosolomide uh, seems to have any effect. Uh, mind you, uh, the numbers are sm is quite small. So again, we, I don't know if this cohort is uh, powered enough to, uh, to answer this question. Which brings me to my second conclusion. Neither adjuvant nor concurrent timosolomide improved outcome in this cohort of patients with IDH water gliomas. Molecular features of glioblastoma identify IDH water astrocytoma patients with an inferior outcome. And MGMT promoter methylation is prognostic, but not predictive for outcome to timosolomide treatment in our cohort of glioblastoma patients. Which brings me to my second poll. Uh, based on the information and the literature, would you now treat a patient that either younger than 70 or older than 70, but has a good performance status uh, with an ID12 of astrocytoma with molecular features of glioblastoma with timosolomide? So the, the, the options that you have here is yes, yes, but only if necrosis or microvascular proliferation were present, no, or I would like to see a well-powered randomized clinical trial for patients with grade two and three IDH 
one or two wild type astrocytoma with molecular features of glioblastoma to be convinced one way or the other. And I will now launch the poll. Okay, and this is our results, and this is very interesting. I think the vast majority of people are split between either already being convinced that this may be of benefit or wanting to see more powerful data. I think uh, we have not been able to dissuade with these data so far. Your comments, Mircha. Okay, well, again, I think all answers could be correct answers, and uh, it, it depends to the clinicians themselves. Um, so, uh, the first uh, one, just yes, could be uh, the correct answer because the STOOP trial and the elderly trials have shown uh, efficacy of temozolomide within uh, glioblastoma patients, and if I'm correct, in the elderly trials, there were also some anaplastic astrocytoma patients, so that could be a reason. Um, or you could say the second one, yes, but only if it's histologically a glioblastoma, because then uh, you're adhering to the STOOP trial, and then you would say, but maybe for like the elderly trials, you uh, miss the younger patients, then maybe there's something going on over there. Um, and no, if you are completely convinced by what we did, then, and you would neglect all the other studies, um, Maybe because the stoop trial uh, along ID12 type uh, patient also had some ID mutant patients and the elderly trials did have younger patients. But I think the easiest answer, which I think most people said, is of course the last one. Um, we were not well powered to answer this, and I don't think any of the previous trials uh, were to answer this question specifically. So if we really want to answer this question, you would need uh, a new randomized clinical trial. But again, all of these options would be okay. So getting back to this slide, I uh, showed the uh, IDH Walter part already. So now I'm going deeper into the IDH mutant astrocytomas. Again, we wanted to identify prognostic, epigenetic, and genetic subgroups, and add these together to create a prognostic predictive model. Uh, for which we, of course, use the same uh, data, only this are from the IDH mutants, the patients. Uh, an important thing to note is that from the copy number data, we also found uh, a couple of patients that had a 1P90Q code lesion, which technically should not have been there, because. but sometimes there are differences between the local pathologist and the central pathologist. Um, so for the first part, they're still in there, but when I'm talking about the IDH mutants and a plastic isocytome specifically, we left these out of the analysis. So we use two uh, genome-wide DNA methylation classifiers, which are uh, available on the internet for, to classify your gliomas. Uh, the classifier on the left is made by the University Hospital of Heidelberg, which used samples from all types of CNS tumors, uh, which we therefore now call the CNS tumor classifier. And the classifier on the right uh, is made by the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, which used only samples from uh, gliomas, which we therefore now call the glioma classifier. Um, and both of these are capable of uh, identifying IDH and mutant samples based on epigenetic data. And both of these are able to identify subgroups within these IDH mutant samples. So first off, both classifiers uh, can make a distinguish can distinguish between the oligodendric gliomas and astrocytomas. But what is more interesting is that both uh, classifiers seem to be able to distinguish between a positive and a negative prognostic group within the IDH mutant astrocytomas based on epigenetics. So on the left, uh, the CNS tumor classifier uh, identifies a larger percentage of negative uh, prognostic tumors which they call the high-grade astrocytomas. Um, and on the right, the glioma classifier has a much smaller percentage of negative prognostic groups, which they call the Gs and Blows. However, the uh, effect, the, the difference in overall survival between Gs and Blow and Gs and High is much larger than the difference between high-grade astrocytomas and lower-grade astrocytomas from the CNS tumor classifier. 
um, to overcome the relatively small number of negative prognostic patients which are found with the glioma classifier. Um, we also added uh, data from uh, GC blood progression. So the same group uh, was able to uh, look into the risk of progression of a tumor from GCP high to GCP low based on seven specific CPGs. And they show that patients that have this risk of progressing of GCP high to GCP low actually have a worse outcome than the patients that do not have this risk of going from GCP high to GCP low. So we assess that in our, our data set as well. And we have a similar percentage of tumors at risk, about 30% as the original paper. And we can also show that the patients that are at risk of progressing from GCP high to GCP low have a worse overall survival. However, uh, the survival is nowhere as bad as the GCP low, so it's an intermediate group that they're able to identify. As I said, we also have uh, genetic data that we wanted to add to this study. Um, so now I'm just only talking about the actual IDH mutant endoplastic esocytomas. And most of these are correctly identified by the DNA methylation classifiers. So by the CNS tumor classifier as IDH mutant esocytoma, low grade or high grade, by the glioma classifier as G sub high or G sub low tumor. However, a very small percentage of these tumors is uh, incorrectly classified as either a 1P90Q codeleted tumor or an IDH wild type glioma. And I think the uh, most important thing here is that you still need the genetic data. You cannot just use the epigenetic classifier, but you need to verify it with genetic data. But that's not the only reason why we wanted to, to look into the genetic alterations. Uh, we selected uh, a few negative prognostic genetic markers from literature, which we wanted to evaluate for our prognostic model. These primarily included uh, alterations from receptor tyrosine kinase signaling alterations, RB pathway alterations, and an overall high copy number variation load. And when we correlate them to the epigenetic subtypes, we see that except for the PI3K mutations, all of these negative prognostic factors are correlated to the negative prognostic epigenetic subtype, so the GCP lows and the high-grade esocytomas. And after univariable analysis, almost all of these alterations, except for the RB1, homozygous deletion, and the MIGN amplification uh, were taken into account for the multivariable analysis. Um, these last two, we just had two, a few cases within our data set, so uh, they were not significant for our data set, but it doesn't mean that there really isn't there. We just didn't have enough patients. So we made a, a combined model uh, with a, the corpus proportion hazard model with a stepwise backward elimination. And this included the age and mini mental state examination at the time of diagnosis. Uh, treatment with timosolomide, um, both the DNA methylation classifiers, amplification of PDGFRA, homozygous deletion of CDK2AB, mutations of PI3K, and the total copy number variation loads. And we did the same for just the clinical factors, and to compare these to final models, we used the Harrell's Concordance Index. For those of you who are not familiar with it, um, Concordance area index of 0.5 means that there is no predictive value of your model, and 1.0 means a perfect predictive model. So the best clinical model that we could make had a predictive value of 0.63, which uh, was similar to previous models that have been made for this type of tumor. Um, but adding the molecular data, we can go up, get up to 0.71, again elucidating the effects of the molecular data for prognostication. And to validate this, we also did an independent recursive partitioning analysis. So we took the factors that were significant from univariable analysis and added them into our analysis. Then the first split that's made is based on homozygous deletion of CD cancer AB. The patients that had no homozygous deletion can then be split uh, if they have received adjuvant tibazolamide, yes or no. 
the patients that had received agent agent solomite can finally be split in a WHO performance score of zero or higher. And the ones that haven't received adjuvant imosolomide can be split uh, with one of the DNA methylation classifiers. This results in five final leaves, which correspond to three uh, outcome groups. Um, and even though adjuvant imosolomide is already standard of care for these uh, patients, uh, this is a very robust model which corresponds with our cost proportional hazard model in our important conclusion that you need a combination of the clinical data, the epigenetic data, and genetic data for correct prognostication of IDH mutant anaplastic cystectomies. Which brings me to my final conclusions. Uh, prognostic relevance of DNA methylation profiling has been validated for IDH mutant 1P90Q non coleated anaplastic glioma patients. Risk of progression from GSM high to GSM low corresponds with worse overall survival for IDH mutant and plastic sarcoma patients. And finally, again, integration of clinical data, DNA methylation profiling, and genetic data is needed for prognostication of IDH mutant and plastic sarcoma patients. Which brings me to my final poll. Uh, does your facility already perform additional molecular assays for IDH mutant and sarcoma patients? And your options here would be yes, both genetic and epigenetic data, yes, but only additional genetic, or yes, but only additional epigenetic, and finally, no, not available, not standard of care. And here, fairly even split again, uh, you really are a master in dividing the audience. <laughs> Please uh, share your comments with us. Thank you. Well, I see that at least like 25% had everything available already. I hope I have convinced the other 75% to make it available as well. Uh, I can also understand if it's not available for specific facilities, but then they can get into contact with other facilities to have them perform these essays for them. But I hope to show you that it's very important to perform all of this for the IDS business and national sector organizations. Then I would like to thank all of the sponsors. I would like to thank everybody that has worked on this uh, trial, all the participating groups and centers. Uh, but most importantly, I would like to thank all the patients and families that were willing to be randomly.